In this episode of the Privileged Band Podcast, we're diving deep into our relationship with alcohol, guided by Rory Furburn. Rory's upbringing was far from straightforward, but he endured to become a senior oil broker in London. And it was here that his personal battle with the city's binge drinking culture sparked a profound awakening. That awakening manifested in the founding of One Year No Beer, which has since helped thousands of people in their relationship with alcohol. Rory's a fascinating guy, and I highly recommend you listen to this episode if your life has been touched by alcohol. So Rory, welcome to the Privileged Man podcast. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's great to have you here. And, and particularly because uh, on a personal front, my relationship with alcohol was certainly part of my journey to getting here. And I'm really looking forward yeah. to exploring. I thought I'd open up by just asking you, what was your journey with alcohol to get you to the point of, of making it your personal mission? Uh, well, yes, thank you for the question. I was born a little bit different. So uh, at six years old, I was diagnosed hyperactive, but you know, really ADHD. Later on in life, I was diagnosed with ADHD and really struggled to fit in with the world, you know, um, very destructive behavior and all of those things. And I think, well, if you have ADHD, you're five times more likely to have uh, addiction or compulsion in your life. And whilst I didn't necessarily have addiction, although the actual dictionary definition of addiction is a compulsive behavior where we repeatedly do, even though we know it hurts us. So, I mean, we're all addicted and uh, addiction is a sliding scale and there's lots of things which fit into that bracket. So, you know, through my teens or whatever, I met alcohol pretty young, 12 years old, it's the first time I ever got pissed and um, got very pissed, you know, threw up and redecorated the house after that first session. But, you know, like everyone that never put me off, that was just part of the, the ritual, you know, almost like why you might go and do psychedelics in South America, you know, you're going to purge, but it's just part of what you need to do on your journey. Then in my, you know, teens and twenties, it just fit very well, you know, alcohol, partying, being outrageous, being wild, that kind of crazy behavior. So I could be more me and everything else. And I was very driven, you know, I was still trying to be successful. I'd started sales careers and started businesses. In fact, by the time I was 25, I'd started six different, five, sorry, different companies, very determined to have an impact on the world. But it wasn't until I actually through the TV program, The Apprentice, which I was contestant number 15 of series two in the UK. There is only 14 contestants. I sat outside the studio for four hours waiting to go on the show. And then eventually they said, look, we can't explain, but you're not going on the show this time. Instead of going back to Scotland, I decided to fly out to Ibiza to get over that rejection. And I met an oil broker. And that oil broker encouraged me to get a job in London as an oil broker. So I moved down to London. And really two worlds collided, you know, partying and being successful. The more I partied, the more successful I was. You know, the job was literally take people out, you know, take people out and, and entertain them. So great lifestyle, great fun. Wine forward, you know, a decade of doing this job. You know, drinking is prevalent every week. You know, you might go for a lunch and some lunches might start at midday and fin finish at six o'clock in the morning, you know, but it'd be easy just to nip down to the pub for a pint before going on the train. Sometimes, you know, texting the missus being like, you know, I've missed the train or the trains are delayed and all those kind of excuses. And whilst I didn't necessarily have a problem with alcohol, I could easily stop. I could stop for dry January. I did that occasionally. I just started to get awareness that alcohol was, was causing more problems. I, I, it was a gentle awareness in the beginning. It's like a small scratching at the back of the head, which is where I think a lot of people are. Certainly on Saturday morning and Sunday morning and sometimes Monday morning, they're just like, was it really worth it? And, uh, you know, do I feel this way and do I need to feel this way? And I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling low and, you know, I'm not quite exercising enough and I'm not as productive as I'd like to be and I'm not achieving the things I want to achieve in life. And I think that's where the scratching starts for people, this little questioning. And I took that scratching and I started to explore it more. Not that kind of scratching, Pete. No, I'm kidding. That kind of gnawing at the back of my mind, I started meditating on the train and meditation is an incredibly powerful tool for building awareness, especially in behavior change, because the noise inside your head, the truth, if you like, your authentic inner version starts to shout at you when you meditate, you can't not hear it. And so that yeah. meditation was like, alcohol is causing you more trouble than you realize, Rory. So then I took it to out into the real world and I, I you know, met up with some friends and I was like, do you know, I think alcohol is 
is holding me back. And of course, you know, this is 13 years ago. People are like, what are you talking about? Don't be ridiculous. Alcohol's amazing. It's the best thing since sliced bread. It brings us women and parties and fun. And I was like, yeah, 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 you're right. I'll shut up. So I went back down in my cave again. Meanwhile, the gnawing, the sort of, hmm, yes, yes, damn, you're better than this. You could, you could be better than this. Like, uh, you've got more to do in the world. That sort of grew and grew. And then I approached my boss. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about taking a break from booze. And he said, you are committing commercial suicide if you stop drinking. And that's how important it was in the broking industry for you to be uh, drinking and, and entertaining clients. It was like, no, this is the only way we do business. So I don't know whether some people listening to this, business owners in insurance, finance, construction, whatever, you name it, whether they're sitting there going, well, yeah, you know, I don't know how I would do my business if I wasn't drinking. I, I, I don't know how I would entertain my clients. I don't know how I would socialize. I don't know how I would have friends. It's like, that's what people think about not drinking. They're like, do I really want to commit commercial suicide? Or do I really want to blow up my life and not have friends anymore? And not, you know, and so in essence, that again, that gnawing in the back of my head just kept getting louder. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I decided to pluck up the courage and take a break. And I did 90 days and I just couldn't believe it. I could not believe how much better I felt. The clarity, the energy, the focus, the niggling health issues started to evaporate. I started to lose weight. I was like, everything is trending better here. Everything is trending better. I need to keep going. So I did. I carried on for a year. And on that year, you know, changed so much about myself, fitter, faster, healthier, happier, better dad, better husband, doubled my business. You know, from being told I was going to commit commercial suicide, I doubled the business and reduced the costs because I wasn't doing all of that crazy entertaining. So it was actually the complete opposite of what I was told of what I was believe, what I believed would happen if I took a break from alcohol. And I think that's what made me so passionate then about trying to help people. And in the beginning, I did the typical evangelical thing, right? I was, you know, not quite, but you can imagine standing out in Piccadilly Circus with the giant bell, right? Hear ye, hear ye, stop drinking. It's amazing. And everyone is like, <laughs> fuck off, go to the pub, you know, just like the whatever Bible bashers or the people who are there preaching. And I was like, okay, well, that doesn't work. You know, the evangelical thing doesn't work. So how am I going to help more people realize that actually everything they're looking for to improve their relationship, to be healthier, to be happier, to be fitter, to be faster, to reach peak performance, to improve their businesses, to have more productivity, less anxiety, less depression, to deal with these annoying niggling health issues. Everything they're looking for is on the other side of something they don't want to do. And hmm, I know, let's create a challenge. Let's, let's just make a, a challenge of it. Something that's cool that you can walk into the pub and like, I'm doing this Spartan race or I'm doing this Tough Mudder. And everyone's like, great, well done. That's amazing. So that's where the idea of One Year No Beer came from. Create a challenge, make it something cool, make it a lifestyle brand. And on that journey, people are going to discover the truth for themselves, which is alcohol's holding you back. Brilliantly put. And thank you for explaining all of that. And I think, I had a question lined up, but then you just said at the end of that, that lifestyle brand, that is so interesting. That is, that is such an interesting way of putting it because it gets talked about a lot, doesn't it? But it's sort of like, well, you either drink or there's AA. Yeah. And, sort of, <laughs> and then in between it, there's sort of 90% of people who are dealing with it as a lifestyle, not necessarily yeah. as an addiction, but as a lifestyle. That's a really yeah. Interesting. Um, well, I, I'm just plucking those stats out, but I don't know. You no, may have something. You're absolutely right. The vast majority yeah. of people, and even even then, you know, a lot of people are in alcohol use disorder, but they're still considering it, you know, lifestyle and not addiction. I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of very driven, successful, functional people who are drinking heavily, very heavily, but turning up to work every day and performing at very high levels or running businesses. I know because they come onto my program, you know, and they might say, "I'm drinking two or three bottles of wine a day." Um, but I've still built a half a billion turnover business. And you're like, wow. <laughs> Imagine what you could do if you get rid of that. Um, yeah, it's, aston so, it's astonishing. My first boss, 
was, you know, Monday, it wasn't Friday, Thursday and Friday lunchtimes. It was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, three yeah. bottles of wine. I mean, that such was the property industry in the yeah. early 2000s. And I, mean, I just want to pick on that a little bit because a lot of people listening in might be like, well, we've all, you know, we've seen the non-alcoholic um, drinks come in and the, you know, low alcohol drinks and all the rest of it because of demand and supply. Are you sensing that there is a change in attitude towards alcohol? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. A massive societal shift. But I sensed that 10 years ago, you know, we were having this zeitgeist moment and everyone was like, wow, you're really in the moment. You know, it's 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 really happening. And yet alcohol consumption is still growing globally. Alcohol consumption per capita is still growing in most countries. And uh, so, you know, we're not anywhere near the tipping point yet. It, yeah, it's absolutely getting more and more interesting. We've got alcohol-free alternatives in pubs. We never had that in my day. Are you kidding me? I'd go into the pub and say, can I have an alcohol-free beer? And the whole pub would go silent like those Western movies. And everyone would be like, oh my God. And the barman would be like, okay. And he'd wander off into the background, right? And he'd he'd get this, reach down to the bottom of the cupboard somewhere like this, pick up this dusty bottle, <laughs> like this, blow it off, and it'd be Bex Blue, right? And he'd be like, swarm, here you go, and pour it into a flowery cup. And you'd be made to be feel ashamed, embarrassed. Like, why are you in my pub if you want this rubbish? So that's what it was like when I was trying to change my relationship with alcohol. Now we've got amazing alcohol-free drinks and alternatives on tap. We've got mixologists creating wonderful spirits. We've got functional drinks growing very rapidly, things like CBD beers and uh, different botanicals to create uh, nootropics inside um, mm. drinks to create calming effects, exciting effects, relaxation, all of those things. And this is absolutely the future. Why though? Why is it the future? Well, because I'm sorry, guys, alcohol is one of the world's most harmful drugs. It's a fact. Alcohol is a significant toxin, okay? It's 100% toxic. It's poisonous to the body. Your body has to process alcohol out of it or you will die. Okay. And so what happens in our brain, it shrink, it kills uh, gray cells. It kills brain cells. It, it's significantly impactful on our mental state and our mental health. The knock on impact of just drinking two units. So, you know, small amount of alcohol interrupts your sleep. Therefore you get sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation, right? Over time, a lot of people drink alcohol for sleep. Yeah, they drink it to get to sleep, but it really disrupts our sleep. We use an incredible device that remotely monitors people's central nervous system. And we show them how stressful drinking is. We show them how what's actually happening to their brain and their body. And we show them that in data. And then we show them how different it is when you change your relationship with alcohol and you actually integrate tools that don't disrupt your sleep, that don't sabotage your stress coping mechanisms, which alcohol does. Um, and so the, the journey of changing your relationship with alcohol has a profound impact on all areas of your life. And if we just bring that back, because I love to go off in circles, I am ADHD, so I forget what I'm saying. I go off on massive tangents. You'll have to remind I've me what the hell we were talking about and who you are in a minute. No, I'm kidding. So, um, <laughs> I've got the, you, don't worry. Again, to our physical body, right? You know, alcohol fosters the perfect environment for cancers. That process, once we start drinking alcohol and it turns into acetaldehyde, and, you know, all of that, that process that happens in there is very, very toxic to your body. You're increasing inflammation in your body, which is increasing the likelihood of diseases and all sorts of, of ill health. So, that's the truth of alcohol. And then you look at the other side of it is the societal impact, right? You know, the, the domestic violence, the, the, um, you know, suicides, the vast majority of suicides are under the influence. The vast majority of, of domestic violence is under the influence. Deaths, hospital admissions, cost to the UK economy. They reckon it costs the UK alone 52 billion a year. Um, the, the, the alcohol. And so it is significantly negative substance that is widely available everywhere. Do you know what is a bit crazy, right? This is a heavily neurotoxic drug, right? Which can lead to death at overconsumption. That is, that often does lead to significant injury and death, right? Let's actually label this as if it was in the pharmaceutical, right? Will cause dizziness, will cause vomiting, <laughs> diarrhea, will, can, you know, can cause, uh, unlikely to be able to drive after one. Let's go through the list of the truth of alcohol. 
And then let's say that there is no guardian of it. It's not at a pharmaceutical where you need a doctor's script to go and get it. You can go to a pub and you can get as much of it as you like. You can go to the shop and order so much you could kill yourself tomorrow. And there's no barrier. There's no framework. There's actually not even any warning on the, on the, on the bottle itself. And that's, that's what's pretty crazy. So coming back just to circle back, sorry, is, this is the reason why society must change its relationship with alcohol is because of all of the damage that it does. It is significantly damaging to our society. It's big when you talk about it in those terms, you know, in, in terms of if it was a pharmaceutical and what warnings it would have on it. And Well, that's coming, that, by the way. In the next yeah. couple of years, labelling is coming on the bottles. In the UK, most of the European Union, you'll have what you see on those cigarettes, uh, horrible, nasty pictures of the truth. Um, so, <laughs> Right, I, it's interesting. What about the why? Why are we, if we go back, maybe many, many, many hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. Why are we drinking? Because, and I want to bring the word trauma into this, because yeah. is it because we are living in literally thousand generational trauma that the thing to do to get over it and not talk, but not, not talk about it is alcohol. Yeah. Have we just become so normalized to not talking about our trauma? in the Western world that we're just going to drink through it. Um, well, I always like to get into the, into the trauma word, but let's go back a little bit. So alcohol originally used as a social elixir. So for many, 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 many decades, I mean, centuries, it was about connecting people together. You know, you came together to, to, to have a drink and meet in a pub and all of those things. Um, so it fostered this sense of connection. Um, and then, you know, big alcohol realized that, you know, their job is really to start helping associate it with different things, which is what marketing does. You know, they, they want to get it into more moments, small things. So that's why we learn that, you know, celebrating, being sexy, being cool, having fun, getting laid, being successful, like all of those things, alcohol is prevalent. And then society kind of continues to run with that. Um, let's just pause for a second. Drinking's fun. Drinking, drinking alcohol is fun. I mean, let's not deny that going to the pub and having a whole bunch of drinks and losing your sense of everything you've got to do and all of the the crap you've got on your plate and all of the worries and the woes and just having a whole bunch of drinks and laughing your bloody head off with a whole bunch of friends that's fun that is fun look at pictures of people who are drinking and it's just about having fun and having a wild time to deny that would be to deny the vast majority of society's reason why we drink and with that we take a quick pause today to bring monumental to your attention Monumental is a personal and professional development platform tailored for men in their professional prime that I founded a few years ago. We're dedicated to igniting purpose, nurturing wisdom, enabling you to craft a legacy that stands the test of time. Our programs are unparalleled in the leadership development space, offering content that truly transforms lives, backed by a commitment to confidentiality that sets us apart. Explore more at monumental.global We'll take a scorecard in the description below. Now, let's get back to the conversation. Now, alcohol is very, very successful at helping people switch off that non-stop brain, which kind of eats us alive all the time. And interestingly, that thinking, that brain is driven by a central nervous system, okay? So through the week, we increase stress. We have inherent stress, stress from past trauma. We have emotional stress. We have stress from the food we eat. We have stress from the things we see, financial woes, relationships. Then we also have our stress from our work. All of those things impact our central nervous system and reduce our ability to deal with stress. Okay, so our, our ability to deal with stress shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And then we get to this hyperactive state where our brain won't shut off and we need a drink to shut it off. And alcohol's brilliant at that. It's an extremely successful tool at switching off those thoughts. The problem is the truth about alcohol, if we go back to that pharmaceutical environment is, let's compare it to a headache pill. Now, let's say you go to the pharmacy and you say, I've got a headache, I need to solve this. And they say, great, here's a pill, take this now. It will solve your headache like that for 15 minutes. And then you'll need to take another one, okay? And then you'll need to take another one, and then you'll need to take another one, and you keep going. And just to warn you, the next day, that headache is gonna be a thousand times worse. Now, that's actually what happens with alcohol. 
we have a busy brain and we can't switch it off. So we use this device to help us switch off the brain, right? And then it switches off nicely. So then we need another one. And then we need another one. And then we need another one. And then we might get to sleep or we might switch off or we might whatever it is. But guess what? You wake up the next day with a busier brain because alcohol is a depressant and it creates those anxious thoughts. And then next, later on in that day, because you didn't sleep that well, and because you also haven't dealt with that stress, you have a lower ability to deal with stress, guess what? You need to drink again at the end of the day. Now, some of mm -hmm. us don't drink like that, right? Some of us actually don't drink on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but the stress builds, that desire builds, that compulsion builds, those things are building inside you. And then Friday comes along and fuck me, the wheels are off. We're going down that binge drinking, shot drinking, everything else, mainly because that compulsion is still being driven. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating dynamic that we have to understand that alcohol is a very, very successful tool at the things that it is taken for. And yet it's often the worst tool for those things because it's actually creating them or making them worse in the first place. Look at them all, okay? Sleep. Lots of people drink for sleep. Alcohol ruins sleep. Alcohol stops you getting deep sleep and REM sleep. It's significantly impactful on our central nervous system. If I put this device on you, you're going to see that your heart is pumping like fucking crazy because you've had alcohol. Why? Because it's toxic. Your central nervous system is working like absolute clappers to get this toxin out of your body. Meanwhile, you're knocked out and thinking you're getting sleep. You're not. So then you wake up tired and sluggish the next day. And guess what? Sleep deprivation drives compulsive behavior. So now you need to drink again at the end of the next day, right? What about in relationships? Similar cycle everywhere. It's a cycle. You've have arguments in your relationship. You think, fuck it. I'll just have a drink because it takes the edge off. But then your drinking causes problems in your relationship because you argue, right? I could go through the list everywhere here of each of these things that actually the reason why it's so insidious alcohol is that most drugs beget themselves. So it is fostering the environment that creates the desire for taking it in the first place. And this is why we fall down a trap of re relying on alcohol, of needing it everywhere, because it started to wheedle its way into all of these different areas that it's actually driving. It's driving the desire and driving the desire over and over mm -hmm. again. Do you see that? Well, totally. And it was very interestingly put, and I'd feel that it does come back to this word trauma. Does that resonate? Trauma is absolutely the main driver of compulsive behavior. Um, so mm -hmm. if we touch on the trauma word, you might use trauma word on your podcast a lot, but a lot of people don't know what that is. They hear it and they think, oh, that's for somebody who was sexually abused in childhood, or they think right. that's somebody who fell out of a plane and banged their head. So let's just explain that what happens during childhood, principally between zero, right? And we even minus. All right, we're, we're, we're now starting to understand that before you were born, how your parents were while you were in that tummy is having a significant impact on your brain development, on your, on, on, on your life going forward. Okay. We're now starting to understand how important that is. We're also understanding that there's generational trauma. Like you said before, like this stuff gets passed on and passed on and passed on. So between zero and seven, we don't have a prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain behind your forehead. That's where we make rational decision making. That's where our morals are. Interestingly, alcohol dulls the prefrontal cortex almost straight away. So when you start drinking, that area of your brain starts to reduce, which is why perfectly good people after a few drinks cheat on wives, drive in cars, go and get a bag of Coke, do stupid shit, right? Because you're no longer having this rational part of your brain, the brain of where your morals, your decision making is fully switched on. Interestingly, regularly cons consuming alcohol over time continues to degrade your prefrontal cortex, which means that you get less honest, more distrustworthy, less following your morals, right? As you consume alcohol over time. Fascinating, wow. right? Wow. So what we now know is that that um, between zero and seven, you don't have that prefrontal cortex. Okay. So when somebody shouts at you today, can I just come in one, in one moment, just, I just, uh, I have to get in on this. Yes. That part has to in the Western world have something to do with the midlife crisis. When the, when man has been drinking for so long or for say, let's call it 10, 15, 20 years that he actually 
comes away, he's so far away from his soul aligned self. And mm. it's because the drinking has dulled that scent, that prefrontal cortex, Could as well you be. say, for, for well so be. long. As that just feels to me, it's just like, think, you know, the, people, yeah, go on. Well, we now know that, you know, alcohol's like kryptonite to the menopause. Um, and so if it's kryptonite to the menopause and the hormonal change and everything else, then maybe it's also kryptonite to the menopause, which is what you're talking about there. Getting back into the trauma, right? Somebody shouts at you today, you go, oh, that's an idiot who hasn't slept well, right? Hopefully. Or if you've got, you know, less um, calmness in your life, then maybe you just punch them in the face. But um, when you're a child, we don't understand and we feel an emotion. And that emotion as a child is, un we don't understand it. And so we learn very quickly to pack it down. We're taught that, come on, they're there, pack it down, pick yourself up, stop crying, you know, don't be a cry baby, be tough. And then later in life, we learn that alcohol is amazing at packing down. Well, what we now understand from this stuff, so you were, use the word trauma. I'm just talking about a child feeling emotions. Everyone has that. Everyone has felt difficult emotions during their childhood. And most of us have not done anything about dealing with them. Now, what we're starting to understand is that those unfelt emotions, those past experiences are highly toxic, right? They, they sit and they rot inside of us. They come out in the forms of addiction and compulsive behavior, but they also come out in the forms of autoimmune diseases and disorders, mental health illnesses, uh, neurodivergence, and diseases, Alzheimer's, dementias, cancers. So what we're now starting to have is a total revolution. You know, when I met the Dalai Lama, which is a phrase I love to say often, when I met the Dalai Lama, I got to ask him a question in front of thousands of people in Pisa. And his big thing is, I don't know how to help people who are addicted today, right? This is his answer. Um, for that, I look to people like you who are doing wonderful things in the world. But the way we change society is by helping our children feel their emotions. And this is such a, an amazing insight now. It's like the drinking is you soothing. The drinking or the compulsion, the food, the work addiction, the porn addiction, the Netflix addiction, this is you seeking to soothe. Um, if one thing in here, because I do talk to a lot of business owners and usually they go, oh, I don't have any trauma or this is not the thing for me, is that the way we have to see this is it's not like you're sitting there feeling past emotions. You're not sitting there at your desk in the middle of spreadsheets and financial forecasts and going, oh, I feel a bit lonely. I think I'll go and have a drink. That's not what happens. You've got this busy brain and you think, I really could do with a drink, right? And what comes in there is underneath that layer, what was that drive? Was it boredom? Was it loneliness? Was it, um, you know, uh, stress in general, willing to switch off? These are the core that's inside. Now, for a lot of people, boredom actually leads to loneliness. And loneliness is a very, very powerful emotion, one that we have really, really packed down. We don't really, we're not aware that we feel lonely uh, for most of us. Um, we're just like, oh, you know, I think I'll go and get some kind of comfort. The reason why is because that loneliness, a lot of our emotions today, they attach to the emotions of the child inside you, okay? Now, when you were young, when you were a young child and you were left to cry out, you were denied love from a parent, you were ignored, you were shut in your room, you were scared of the dark, whatever it was, you felt loneliness a thousand times more painful than you understand it today. You see a child, when it feels an emotion, it is everything to that child. It has not yet learned to regulate its emotions. It's not yet learned to understand it. And that emotion, instead of being dealt with, is packed down into this little thing inside here. And so you, being bored, thinking you want to have a drink, actually touches into that old, old, old painful emotion. And that's why it's so compelling and you can't stop it. And how do we do the work with that? Well, it's about releasing that past emotion, right? Something I went through into this piece is, I, through my own work of doing the trauma work, I have done decades of talk therapy, right? Six years old, I was in talk therapy because I was completely nuts. I've been in therapy for 20, 30 years, psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, psychodynamic therapist, you name it, counselors. And it wasn't until I started to do some of the work, so meditation, somatic work, that I discovered that when I was two years old, I fell off the boat. Okay. Now I wasn't aware of this. We weren't talking about it. The family didn't talk about the moment I fell off the boat. It just wasn't a conscious conversation, but I discovered it through feeling. Okay. There was this feeling and I remember the boat and I had a conversation with my mum. Now, when I fell off the boat, my dad had to dive down and save me. 
And I got awareness that I had this pattern inside my subconscious that I need someone to save me. So how did that show up in my life? This might blow your mind a little bit. So I would be so self-destructive, but whenever I was self-destructed, I always did it with somebody just there. Now this was taken to its extreme when I tried to kill myself. The first time I took an overdose and my brother was downstairs and he took me to the hospital. The second time I hung myself and my parents came back at the moment I did that, like literally at the moment. Um, and then later in life, I would seek partners who would be there to save me. In my businesses, I was always looking for agencies or leaders or mentors to come and save the business. I didn't even know I had this pattern running on. I didn't even know it existed until I got aware of it. And the powerful part about trauma and understanding that is that once I got aware of it, it's in the conscious. So how it goes is I'm like, huh. I'm running that pattern again. I'm trying to find somebody to save me. I don't need anyone to save me. I'm perfectly capable of sorting this situation out myself. And that understanding two years ago changed everything. I mean, you can almost see it in the P&L in the business, how much it transformed my business. Once I got mm -hmm. aware of this pattern that I was running based on some trauma I wasn't even conscious of. Last thing to say there, Pete, is people say, I, I can't think of, I don't think anything traumatic happened to me. <sighs> If you understand trauma, then you understand that as soon as the brain feels something traumatic, it tries to hide it. It puts it in the subconscious, right? So we actively put our trauma, our past experiences, those difficult things into the subconscious so that we can operate at a higher level, right? And so trauma is of the subconscious for the vast, vast majority of people. It's about the feeling, not thinking about what it is. It's about the feeling. Um, and this is why we use somatic experiencing. This is why we use meditation as tools, hypnotherapy, things like that, because we want to help people ch change their relationship with these feelings. And this is such a big driver of compulsive behavior. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being so honest, vulnerable, and, and real about, about that as well. It's a, a very interesting and personal thing to me because my relationship with alcohol became very, very abusive. In my late 20s, it was all bantered off, but it really was the starting gun, if you like, to using all of those other lovely little addictions. From what we saw over the last you know, decade of, of helping people to take a break from alcohol. We had a piece of research, which is now nearly 40,000 people have done it in that we ask a question, you know, what would you like your relationship with alcohol to look like? 6% want to stop drinking. The other 94% say that they'd like to have a better relationship with alcohol. And similarly, mm -hmm. we had these, you know, interviews with people who were signing up to our challenges to stop drinking. And they'd say, oh, you know, well, it took me two years to sign up to your challenge. Two years, two years of watching our Facebook ads, of listening to the reviews. What does that mean? Nobody wants to stop drinking. Not nobody, but most people don't want to stop drinking. Now, the thing is, most of the rhetoric out there is stop drinking or come be sober. It's amazing. Sober is amazing. You know, not drinking is absolutely fantastic, but it's not helping the vast majority of people. Like what we need to do is be having a conversation to say, hey, guys, why don't you just cut back a bit? Why don't you reduce how much drinking you are? Why don't you try and control your drinking? So that was a big change for us. Two years ago, we launched our program, Complete Control, based on a decade of science and understanding what drives compulsive behavior. And the idea was we can take business owners, execs, high achievers through a journey of understanding using technology, data, evidence, what is driving the compulsive behavior. And when you take them through that journey and you show them in data, right? Hey, these are the things that are causing this compulsion. The alcohol is not the problem. Alcohol is what you're using to solve your problems. And when you start addressing those underlying things and shift those, well, guess what? Mostly you choose not to drink. And that's exactly the outcome for people. Uh, so we want people to be able to get to that place that they want, which is, look, I want to be able to have a drink now and again, but I just don't want it to be so ingrained. I don't want to be relying on it. I don't want to rely on it for stress. I don't want to rely on it for socializing. I don't want to rely on it anywhere, but I, if I want to at a wedding or at a special event, or, you know, maybe just once a, you know, once a month dinner with my wife, I want to be able to have a glass or two because our society is completely drenched in it. It turns out that that is the goal for many, many people, the vast majority of people. It also turns out that control is a thousand times more complex than abstinence. 
Abstinence is easy. It's yes or no. No thanks, I don't want to drink. And yes and no decisions come from the primitive part of the brain. It's instinctful. It's actually really easy to make that decision. Maybe comes from a completely different area. In fact, it comes from a multitude of areas in the brain. Your emotional state at the moment, your environment, your memories, right? Lots of different areas of your brain are involved in the decision of maybe. So from a neuroscience perspective, it's more complex to get control. But also what people don't realize is to go in search of abstinence, I'm going to stop drinking. The reason why it's easy is because you don't actually have to address any of the underlying causes. You can use willpower. You can just literally avoid, you can avoid your social circle. You can change who you hang out with. You can do all those things. You cannot deal with those things underneath. And then what happens is when you do have a drink, it comes back like a steam train. And this is what lots of people do. They stop drinking for six months. They stop drinking for a year. And then next minute, they're back exactly where they were. And they're like, okay, well, I must have a problem. <laughs> no, you don't have a problem. You don't have a disease. You just haven't dealt with the things that are driving the behavior in the first place. Mm. And that's what I wanted to help people understand. It's like, this is not some kind of bizarre journey that you can't learn. Think about it like this, okay? Let's say that right now, you listening to this podcast, you're the physical equivalent drinker of being obese, okay? You are on the bed, eating pizza every day, right? You are absolutely massive. That is the state you are right now, which if we look at the drinking alternative, that would be you're drinking every day, you're reliant on it for most things, you're saturated in booze. And I wanna say to you, hey, you know, you wanna be able to control your drinking. Well, that's the equivalent of being able to run a 5K in under 20 minutes, right? Now, to get that person to be able to run a 5K in under 25 minutes, that's going to be one hell of a journey, right? We've got a lot of work to do. We've got to work on their mindset. We've got to work, get them training. We've got to start gently in the beginning. I mean, and they're in their bed right now, right? But it is a journey that they can do. It is possible. Now, it might not be possible for all of them because maybe they're too far gone and that might break their bones or they might have done some significant damage. But for the vast majority of people, they're not that obese. They're just a little bit chubby, right? And they're out of exercise, so can they get to a sub 25K? Of course they can. Can they do it themselves? Of course they could, right? They probably need to go and find out some research and everything else. But would they like to get it done in the shortest possible time? Well, that's why you would come on a program like ours, because we really mm -hmm. want to shorten down that journey of learning, of discovery, so that it happens as fast as possible for you to understand with clarity what was driving the behavior in the first place. Very interesting. And so again, we're talking to that 90%, right? I mean, because obviously there are the 10% who are addicted in the, and, and having significant issues and have to say no. I, I mean, yeah. I imagine that's what, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I imagine that's what we're ta you're talking to. So the I majority am. of people just have to, you know, coming back to this word of, of trauma and childhood and, and feeling into what's, what their actual uh, reasons for drinking are more than actually yeah. saying, well, it's like, it's a physical thing and, you know, it's a yes or no thing. We have our really 10, 10 core drivers and number one, the most biggest driver for the vast majority of compulsion, which will also change your life in such enormous, significant ways, change how you show up in your relationships, how you parent, how you are in business, everything is trauma, past experiences as a child. That's the number one major driver of compulsion for us. Number two, mm -hmm. stress. Stress is so significant that most of us are actively self-sabotaging our stress coping mechanisms. We don't, we've never even been taught how to handle stress properly. Uh, so we use data, we use a device to help people understand their stress. We coach them through, we turn people into stress eating machines. And I say to people, you want to come and change your relationship with alcohol? Great. But if I turn you into a stress eating machine, what will that do for you over the next decade? Like it's transformative, right? I had a guy who runs a half a billion turnover business. He said, Ruri, I don't think I've ever had so many fires in my business and I don't think I've ever been calmer. Like, what would that do for you if you were able to do that? So stress, major driver. Then we start looking at things like relationships, our closest relationships, our environment. Of course, mm -hmm. if our environment is just absolutely saturated with alcohol and, and it's poor, it's negative, it's critical, all of those things, right? Our environment connection, our sense of connection to society and around us. And one of the greatest mistakes people make is that they associate not drinking, i.e. dry Jan, right? I'm going to do dry Jan, 
I'm going to avoid my social circle. I'm going to cancel any kind of entertaining. I'm going to do things I don't really want to do or don't like doing, like drinking green juice and occasionally going to the gym. I'm going to count down the days till the first of the month when I can go out with my friends and have a drink again. Well, what I'm doing there is A, proving to myself that I need alcohol to have an amazing life, right? Which is only building the neural pathways in the wrong direction I want to go. But also I'm becoming more disconnected. Like people stop drinking and they become more disconnected from their community. Well, unless you're a sociopath, you can't be disconnected. So that just drives people back to drinking. And then they go, oh, well, the only, I seem to have a problem because I keep returning to drinking. No, you just haven't built connections with people who are living how you want to live that are inspiring you to change your relationship with alcohol. So these are the, really the core drivers. There's a whole bunch of others, mental health, emotional regulation, etc. But we know from science what drives compulsive behavior. We just have to help people change those. I love it. And it obviously very aligned with what I'm all about and what we're all about in terms of community and cool. connection and that being, and you talked about loneliness earlier, and I talk about loneliness being the starting gun to being to more significant mental health issues and anxiety, depression, suicide. And so loneliness really and being in community is the antidote. And I think that with regards to alcohol, you know, there's the, obviously the, the community the vast majority of the community, certainly in the, in the UK, which is in the drinking side, but people are like, well, what happens if I stop drinking? Even if I take a break, who's going to be, who's on the other side? Because it's exactly. like, if you don't know, you don't know. And right. Yeah. But there is actually now this, there are communities, obviously. It is growing significantly. So I think mm -hmm. there's more people to belong there, but also I think that and this might be another unpopular belief as well. I think it's easier for me to have one with people than it is for, for me to have none. Um, and that's why I choose to have one now and again. I'd rather go out with my friends and have one or two and then leave it at that than I would not drink at all. And most of the time I choose not to drink. But, you know, when you do that, when you have one, most of the peer pressure is gone. Most of the, the peer pressure is eliminated, right? And um, the, 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 core question is people listen to this and go, oh, I just couldn't do that. If I had that one, I'd fall down the rabbit hole and I'd have 20. I hark back to my personal development journey. <laughs> you just have work to do and that's it. You just have work right. to do. Um, but it's something that you can solve. That's certainly an interesting point that the, you know, the owner, the founder, the, the, the inspiration behind one year, no beer goes out and, and has one or two beers. Yeah. Well, it was called One Year No Beer a decade ago. I'd love to change the name of the uh, the company and we will be changing branding um, because, you know, it, it, that's what I'm saying here. For the first eight years, I helped people stop drinking. And now I've realized that that is not the solution. It's not helping the vast majority of people and the work is far greater than that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I believe in helping people to eliminate the vast majority of drinking. And sure, control may be for some people zero, which is great. So that's the journey that they go on. They go on and realize, you know what? I never want to add it back in again, which is like you, Pete. Lots of people come through our complete control program and decide that they are done with it for good. What a fantastic solution. Um, that is an amazing thing. I got them earlier because I talked about control. They came in because they want control. And then we help them see that actually life, everything that they want is better without it. And so now they're choosing not to have it. Instead of going through this journey of trying to get, trying to be zero and then bouncing back and then having a problem and creating this idea that they've got a problem because they're yo-yoing between the two. So yeah. One last question. What did Richard Branson say to you when you, when you met him? Um, well, I mean, you can read it up on his um, social media because he posted about meeting me on his social media. Yeah, it was, it's kind of an amazing moment, really, because, you know, I wrote him a letter when I was 14 years old and I said I was going to change the world one day and looking forward to having lunch with you. And I nearly got out there and was going to be going to Necker Island through some, through some friends of friends. And, um, you know, the, the guy who ran the event was very excited to have me sit next to Richard and tell the story. And it was very much, you know, because my dad had encouraged me to write this letter after that suicide attempt. And, um, you know, it was like, hey, dad, you know, I made it type thing. And unfortunately, the trip got cancelled. And then my dad died just a few months later. So I never got to, to have that um, conversation. 
And then uh, he was out here in Mallorca opening up the hotel and I just sort of turned up and as, as I turned up there at the moment, he was standing in a pulpit staring out at the view on his own. So I just walked up to him and I told him this story, which was quite a bit longer than this. It's also on my social media if you're interested to read the story in full and got quite teary eyed reading the story and he gave me a big hug and he said, look, I'm really sorry you didn't get a chance to have that lunch, but you know, why don't you stay with us for dinner? And um, so I stayed there and I never had dinner with a bunch of billionaires before, but it was pretty cool. It was a whole bunch of really interesting people, Indian billionaires and all sorts of, yeah, it was amazing. So, um, and he was such a, such a lovely, lovely guy. And then he posted about it on his social media, which is, which is great. So amazing. Yeah. And an impactful, an impactful experience meeting Richard. Yeah, well, good for you, and I'm sure your father would be very proud of of you and that and why well, at, at that moment and everything that you've done. So. He always was. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, how can people get in touch with you or learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, please reach out to me. I'm on social media, so I'm on Instagram, Ruri Fairbairns, and um, usually pretty active there. And um, but you can find me on all channels. Uh, one year no beer is one year no beer dot com, or we're on socials on O Y N B. Um, feel free to have a listen to the content. We've got tons of free content, podcasts, all of that kind of stuff. We produce a huge volume of free stuff to the world to help everyone. We have our courses, our, our digital courses to help people take a break from alcohol. And then our program specifically for business owners, execs, high achievers, complete control, which is kind of a revolutionary technology enabled preventative rehab. I like to call it at the moment, but um, nobody likes that rehab word. So it's a, it's a really amazing program. Very proud of it. And um, yeah, it, thank you very much for having me on. I think, you know, I'm just happy to keep spreading this word. And I think the word is super simple. You know, it's, it's just down to one, one thing is that I bet you with everything I know and every penny I've ever made uh, that if you're regularly consuming alcohol, it's holding you back. And that's it. It's just super simple. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm sure people will have definitely heard the message there. So thank you for coming on and uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. And well done on your journey, Pete. And thanks for the good work that you're doing. And thanks for having me on the show. Cheers, man. So thank you for joining me, Pete Hunt, on the Privileged Man podcast. If you're interested in learning more about our personal and professional development platform for men in their professional prime, please visit the website monumental.global for more details.